Welcome to Grow Virtually, an online horticultural educational program presented by the Master Gardener Volunteers of Cobb County. Under the guidance of the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension Service, we grow gardeners. Uh, growing vegetables in containers is really easy. All you need is a windowsill, a patio, a balcony, a door step, any place that you have sunlight you can have a container garden. The reason why you want to use a container garden, basically, um, if you're limited by insufficient space or an unsuitable area, you can consider um, a container garden to grow your own fresh vegetables. And you can grow flowers, vegetables, and herbs in a container, but we're going to mostly focus on growing vegetables um, in a container um, tonight. So why would you want to grow something in a container? instead of in the ground? Well, there are a few reasons why. Um, first of all, you have more control over the container than you would if you were putting it in ground because in ground, um, it's gonna be susceptible to everything in the ground, any insects, any pests, um, people. Um, you have a little bit more control when you're growing in a container. Um, first of all, soil borne Ill illnesses and diseases are a little bit better to, uh, easier to control when you're growing in a container. Um, and pest management is also easier when you're growing in a container. Why? Because you can see it. You can get up close and personal. Um, for me, I love growing in containers because I can see everything that's going on. I can sit there next to my plants and I feel really close to my plants um, when they're in a container. I can move them around. I can bring them in. I can put them in the front, the back. Um, you know, you can just do so much with the containers. Um, so it's an easy way also to introduce kids to gardening because once again, the plants are right there close up with the kid. They're about the same height, so it's easier. And if you look at the first picture, um, the containers that they are using are just simple buckets, um, things that were not necessarily intended for a container garden, but you can use them for a container garden. Uh, what can be grown in a container? That's what people ask. What can I grow in a container? Well. You can grow pretty much everything in a container um, that you would grow in a regular garden. Um, things that are really suited for a container garden would be in the summertime, we grow lots of tomatoes and peppers, eggplants, onions, beans, lettuce, squash, radishes, parsley. Now, when you look at squash, say um, a yellow, yellow squash or a zucchini squash, that's gonna take up a lot of space. So you wanna think about whether or not you really wanna put that um, in your container. If you've ever grown zucchini or yellow squash, you know that those plants get huge. They take up a lot of space. So you're going to have to have a large container and it's only going to hold one of those. So unless you really have a lot of space, I wouldn't do that, but you can if you have plenty of space and plenty of containers to do so. Um, pole beans and cucumbers, they also do well, but you have to um, they have to have some type of support. So if you're gonna put them in a container, you know that we normally um, trellis them going up. So if you're gonna put them in a container, you're gonna also have to have some type of trellis that's gonna fit in that container that you can control, meaning it can't be too big. Um, so instead of doing pole beans, you may want to consider um, bush beans, which won't grow up. They'll just grow out and get bushy, but they won't grow up. So the kind of, plants that you choose for your container garden really matters. Um, so you want to look at the variety that you choose. For example, I wouldn't get an indeterminate tomato and put that in a um, container because just as the name says, it's indeterminate. It could grow very big. Um, it could get very long and then you won't be able to control it. So what I try to do is I look for varieties that say um, container garden friendly um, or something like that, like for example, it might, it might say um, container garden tomato, or it may say um, easy to grow in containers. But when you look at the different varieties, look and see what it says about the height of the plant, the width of the plant, how long it's gonna take to grow, because once again, you are limited by space uh, with the container. Um, if you look at these, these are very pretty containers. You see, They've chosen a wooden one, but it's not just wood. This seems to be one. They put the liner in there and that's fine. You can use a liner inside of something like this that has holes in it, or you can use a container 
that is completely closed up. You just want to make sure you have some drainage. That's really important that the plant is able to drain because if it can't drain, you're going to start with a whole lot of problems from the beginning. And there are a lot of different types of containers. This is a beautiful, large container and everybody will not be able to have something this nice. Um, as you can see, it's well built. It has wheels on it so you can really move it around. It has a lot of plants. And what I was talking about earlier about plants growing up, um, they built a nice trellis for this. Um, so it's growing up and it's, you have room to go up and also to go out. So you're kind of doubling your space because you have all the space right there at the soil and then you have the trellis and things can grow up the trellis. Um, they also have a watering system here. So the only thing that's for me, that's a problem with my um, container garden is, what if I go out of town? I'm used to uh, watering my containers every day. So if I go out of town, I gotta have some type of watering system, um, but we'll go over that a little bit later on as to what you can do um, if you have to be out of town and you're worried about losing your plants while you're gone. So let's look at the growing medium. If you're gonna be um, doing a container garden, what are you gonna be growing it in? Um, what type of media are you gonna be using? So any growing media must provide water, nutrients, and a physical support in order to grow healthy plants. Um, it must also be well-drained so you can use synthetic or soilless mixes um, as well, as well, they're well suited for um, vegetable container gardening. And this could be composed of sawdust, wood chips, peat moss, perlite, vermiculite. So a lot of different things other than just soil um, you can use as a media. Um, these are usually free of disease and weeds. They hold moisture and nutrients, but drain well, and they are also very lightweight. Um, soilless mixes can be prepared by mixing horticultural grade vermiculite, peat moss, limestone, superphosphates and garden fertilizer. Um, composted cow manure is then added to improve the soil's physical properties as well as the nutrients um, source. Uh, and the soil mixes tend to hold water a little bit better than the soilless mixes, but that's not to say that you should choose one or the other. It's totally up to you what you use. The main thing is you wanna make sure that you're giving your plants lots of nutrients. And you see here um, the different things you can use. Orchid bark, um, I've used that before. It is for or orchids, but you can mix it in um, with other mediums as well. I use quite a few, whatever I have, I kind of mix in and just make a recipe of different things that I know will work well. Okay, so soilless media can be inorganic, meaning sand, gravel, pebbles, perlite, you know, vermiculite, rock wool, um, rice hulls, peat, sawdust, coconut koi, which I just recently discovered, but I love it, especially um, for seed starting and it's very inexpensive as, as well. Um, you can use a soil mix, which is made up of equal parts of sphagnum, peat moss, or compost, pasteurized soil, vermiculite, and perlite. So you see, you have a lot of different things that you can use in your um, container. Um, so just don't feel like you have to choose one or the other. The more you grow, the more you'll come become comfortable with knowing what these different things are and where you can find them. Um, none of them are very expensive. They are pretty affordable. So, you know, you can buy small bags of each one or depending on how much you're going to be growing, you know, and mix them all together. All right. So what about containers? What type of containers can you grow um, can you use for your container garden? Well, I mean, the possibilities are really endless. Um, if you look at the guy in the picture here, um, I don't know if you all know what that is, but what he's usually using is basically a hanging shoe container. Um, you know how you have, if you look at this, he has it laid to the side, but if you were pick it up from one end to the other, that is what you would hang in your closet and put your shoes in. Or if you have kids, you might hang it up in their closet and put their cute little toys or clothes or something in there. Um, so it's so many different things that you can use. And this, um, he may have put some holes in the bottom to add a little drainage, but I mean, the possibilities are endless what you can use. Um, so any, any type of container for the most part can be used to plant. Um, the size of the container will vary according to the crop selection and the space available. 
So think about something that's going to grow really big. You want to have a larger container, but something that's going to stay fairly small, you can use a smaller container. So look at a pot from six to inches, six to 10 inches in size. They're easy um, and you can grow stuff like herbs, green onions, parsley. So you don't have to have a very large pot to grow um, your herbs in. And if you're starting to garden for the first time, um, starting with herbs is a great introduction to gardening. Um, for me, when I try and help people get started gardening, especially those who say, oh, I don't have a green thumb, I kill everything. I tell them to start with some simple herbs. Just buy yourself some herbs, put them in a pot and just watch them grow. Um, and the main problem that I have with people and they say they plants die is lack of water. I mean, you gotta look at the fact that right now we're, uh, well, the, the temperature is cooled down a bit this week, but we were, you know, averaging 92 to 95 degrees. And with those kind of temperatures, you have to make sure that you're watering your plant often and the container that you're using will matter as well, you know? So um, if you have a smaller container, you just know you're gonna have to water a lot more as opposed to a very large container with lots of room. You can water one time and then you may not have to water again for another couple of days or so. Uh, for most vegetable crops, such as tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, a five gallon container are the most suitable size, while, while a one to two gallon container are best for charred and dwarf tomatoes. So once again, dwarf tomatoes are gonna stay small in size, not the tomato itself, but the plant is gonna stay small. So you can use a smaller um, container for that. Um, but if you can find one of those five gallon containers, great. Um, you know, the larger container you can find, the better for you. Sometimes you can put several different plants in a larger container um, together. And if you wanna mix some flowers in with um, some vegetables that are growing to make it look pretty, that's great, especially if you're gonna have it maybe near an entrance or a front um, porch or, you know, where other people will see it, you may want it to look pretty. And you can just make a nice container garden by putting in some plants. I like to put, um, uh, uh, basically pepper plants and some flowers together and maybe one herb. And that makes a really cute uh, container garden. Um, but regardless of the size of the container, it must um, drain well. That's something you don't wanna overlook. Um, it may already have drainage holes in it. So whenever you're getting that container, check to see if it has those drainage holes. And if it doesn't, just know that you're gonna have to create some type of drainage holes. Um, I'll give you a little story about these cute pots. And I was like, oh, these are so cute. I'm gonna grow my aloe veras in them. Well, um, I bought them home and I realized that there was no hole in the bottom. Now, this was made out of some type of concrete or something, very pretty and smooth but there was no way I was going to be able to get any um, drainage in that. I tried, you know, with my drill, but it just didn't work. So I just decided this is something that I can use, but I have to know that it's going to have to be a plant that I'm not going to have to worry about um, drainage, you know, so you can put, you know, maybe, um, I don't know, something like a catcus because you don't water a cactus very often. So you don't have to worry so much about drainage, but when you do water it, you gotta know that I don't wanna overwater this because there's no drainage here. Um, adding about one inch of gravel in the bottom of containers will help with your drainage. Sometimes the soil at the bottom of that container can get so compacted that it's really not draining. And when that happens, you're gonna have a problem because it's gonna make the roots start to um, rot and then you're gonna also have diseases. So just putting some um, pebbles at the bottom. Um, I mean, I've even seen people put those little peat, those little um, styrofoam peanut things that come you know, in your packages. Um, you can put those in the bottom, but put something in there so that that soil is not so tight that it's not draining out well. Um, and a lot of times the drainage holes will work better when they're kind of on the side of the container at the very bottom. I know most of you don't see that, but if you can do that, if you can get some, especially if it's a plastic container, you can just drill some holes on the sides um, near the bottom. And you'll actually be able to see that water when it's draining out. So you'll know how much water is going in and how much is coming out. Okay, so let's talk a little about the seedlings and transplanting. Um, Vegetables that can be easily transplanted are better for um, container cultures. 
Um, for me personally, I find that dillweed is very finicky. It doesn't like to be moved a lot. Um, it really likes to stay in the pot that you started it in. That's not to say that it won't survive. It will survive, but it takes a long time to get acclimated and to feel comfortable. So think about um, certain plants and whether or not they transplant well. We know that tomatoes transplant very well. Sometimes I go from um, a small pot to a medium pot to a large pot in one summer with those tomato plants because I know they're not gonna be shocked by that change. As, as I said, something like dill will. Um, also peppers, peppers do well when you move them from their small pot to a larger pot. Uh, so transplants may be purchased from a local nursery or they can be grown at home. So sometimes I start everything from seeds and I try and get started fairly early on, especially for my peppers that take a really long time. I may start my peppers, I would say maybe mid-February and know that they're gonna stay in their little seedling containers for at least another month. And then I'm gonna transplant them maybe to a larger pot, but it may be a third pot that they eventually go in because I give a lot of mine away. So I'm, I'm growing things, but I'm growing them to share with other people. I love sharing plants. Um, so, but don't worry about what you're starting the seedlings in. You can start them in just about anything. Um, you can start with a baking pan, um, plastic trays, um, pots, cardboard, milk containers. I'm really big into recycling. So anything that can have a second life, I'm going to try and give it a second life. And look at all the plastic containers we get, um, just say in a week or two, look at all those plastic containers. So think about using those plastic containers as your seed start. It's one of my favorite ones. Um, whenever you buy salad, and you get salad in that big plastic container, that's a perfect container to start your seeds in. And you can even create a little greenhouse effect with that because it has a top. Um, and you can put the top down and have somewhat of a greenhouse effect going on. Um, you don't wanna leave that out in the sunshine because I have had plants that I had growing in one of those plastic containers and it got too hot and it will kill your plants off. Um, so you want to fill the containers with the medium, medium we described above and cover most vegetable seedling one foot to a half an inch um, to ensure good germination. Um, another method is to use peat pellets or peat pots. Um, a lot of people like to use, use those. They're cute. Um, they cost a little bit more. So if you're going to be planting a lot like me, I may plant 100, 200 um, seeds and hopefully all of those germinate. So those little peat pellets just, they're not practical for me, but they may work well for you. Once again, how you start to grow is totally up to you and totally about what you feel comfortable doing. Um, landscape cloth, the screen in the bottom of the pots will improve drainage and invigorate um, the plant's growth as well. So whether you start your container gardening from seeds or from transplants is totally up to you. Um, when you're new to gardening, most people feel more comfortable going to Lowe's, Home Depot, someplace like that, and just purchasing the transplant. A lot of the work has already been done for you. So you don't really have to worry about, oh, whether or not these seeds are going to germinate and, you know, what they're going to look like. And, you know, am I going to be able to take care of them? The work is already done for you. All you got to do is pop them in the pot and let it go and just take care of it. Okay. So let's move on to fertilization. Oh, that's a biggie. Um, a lot of people talk about fertilizer and whether or not you should, shoot, should use fertilizer. Well, you should definitely be fertilizing your plants. But I think the question is whether or not you're using a synthetic or in, or, or in, or, or in organic fertilizer. That's hard to say. Um, so me personally, I use organic fertilizers always. Um, but I'm not telling you what to do. A lot of people still use miracle Grow, and that's up to you what you use. miracle Grow does have an organic line of products now, so you can look at that. If you see the black containers, that is their um, line of organic fertilizer. Um, so uh, uh, fertilizers will be either time release or water soluble. Now the time release is mixed with potting medium and um, it could be a pelleted time-release fertilizer, 
but it is the one that is solid. And then you have the water soluble fertilizers and they are liquid. They have to be mixed with something because they are very, very concentrated. So it doesn't matter which one you use. Once again, it's totally up to you and your taste, you know, and what uh, works for you. Sometimes it's a matter of cost. Um, you know, um, do you want to pay the money for a big bag, uh, say cow manure, um, or do you want to get just a jar because it's easy for you to take that little jar and mix that with um, a two uh, a gallon of water? So it just depends on what you're most, most comfortable with. Um, the easiest way to add fertilizer to plants growing in containers is to prepare a nutrient solution and then pour it over the soil mix. But once again, that's up to you. Now, we also use compost and compost is somewhat of a fertilizer, even though it's kind of in its own category. I love compost. I'm excited about compost. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a minute. So if you're buying fertilizers, when you buy fertilizers, whether it is um, synthetic or it's organic, you're going to have three numbers on there. Um, and that's going to be, may say, 10, 20, 10, um, 5, 5, 5, 0, 5, zero, um, you're gonna see some numbers on that. And these three numbers um, indicate the percentage of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So these figures are always listed in the same order, NPK. That's what you're gonna see, NPK, um, because the two Ps, phosphorus and potassium, both of Ps, they changed the last one to K, so you know the difference, but it's always in that order. It's never gonna be you know, phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium is always going to be nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, so say, for example, if you get a 100-pound bag of 10, 20, 10 fertilizer, that means it contains 10 pounds of nitrogen, 20 pounds of phosphorus, and 10 pounds of potassium. That equals 40 pounds of nutrients. The rest of the fertilizer or 60 pound is a carrier filler, say sand, perlite, rice husk, or something. But that is how much fertilizer is going to be in there. So you understand what you're getting. Um, all plants, now let's go over NPK, what they really are and what they mean to you. Um, some people get a little confused about this, but it's really central, uh, simple. Nitrogen, okay, is for growth. And I have another slide you can look at. So don't, you know, uh, feel like, oh no, I don't understand what she meant. We're going to go over the next slide and I think you'll see it a little bit better and understand, understand it. But um, the nitrogen is needed for growth. That means the roots, the leaves, the stem, and the flowers and the fruits. Nitrogen gives plants their green color and it is needed to form protein. A lack of nitrogen causes the lower leaves to turn yellow. So think about that. Whenever your leaves start to turn yellow, it could be a nitrogen deficiency. Um, the whole plant turns a pale green. On the other hand, too much nitrogen can kill the plant. So you have to be careful with that. Some people want to just put a lot of fertilizer in there. Well, that's going to be just as bad as not having enough. So you don't want to overdo it. It's just like you, if you eat too much, that's bad for you. But if you don't eat at all, that's bad for you. So it's the same thing with plants. All right. So we said nitrogen is for growth. And then next we have the phosphorus. Phosphorus is needed for cell division to help form the roots, the flowers, and the fruit. So we said nitrogen um, is good for the green color. So you want to green it up. The phosphorus is going to help the roots to actually form, not necessarily turning everything green, but getting that phosphorus in there is going to help those roots to really form. Okay. Now, potassium. Potassium, um, for plants need potassium for many of the chemical processes that allow them to live and grow. A potassium shortage will show up in a variety of ways, but stunted growth and yellow lower leaves are common symptoms um, of potassium deficiency. So if your plant isn't growing and it's really little and short and you wonder what's going on, it could be the potassium. Okay, so I said the next slide will help you to see that a little bit better. All right, so here we go. So once again, NPK, there you go. We're talking about that. So when you look at this, chart, it kind of gives you a better understanding of what your fertilizer is doing. So nitrogen, remember we said it greens up the plant. So just thinking up, up, greening up, growing up, all right? It's very important to have nitrogen and you can get nitrogen into your garden by just growing some peas or beans and then let it, they actually add nitrogen back to the soil. So a lot of people will grow beans or peas 
um, just to add nitrogen back into the soil. And you don't even have to pull it up. You can just plow that over or turn it over and the whole plant will provide you nitrogen, okay? And then we talked about the phosphorus. So the phosphorus we said was for the roots. So it's gonna help to really develop those roots. So you really need that phosphorus early on in your plants because those roots are so important. So the phosphorus is gonna go down. So think phosphorus down. So you're trying to get those roots um, to grow and to become strong, okay? And then last but not least is the potassium. So the potassium, we said up for the nitrogen, down for the phosphorus, and then potassium, you look at that as the all around um, that's needed for the well-being of the plant. So don't take this for granted when you're thinking about starting a, a container garden because you have to make sure you have plenty of nutrients for your plants because those nutrients will leach out um, with watering, they're just going to leach out the bottom. So if all you're doing is giving your plants water, water, water every day, and you never give them nutrients, well, it's kind of like, what if you just had water and you, you didn't have any other nutrients? You wouldn't survive. And that's the same thing with the plants. You have to make sure you're giving them plenty of nutrients so they not only survive, but they thrive, okay? All right, so let's look at some more fertilizers. Um, what is a complete fertilizer? Have you ever heard that term complete fertilizer? What does that mean? Well, a complete fertilizer is a fertilizer blend or mix that contains all three of the nutrients we just talked about, um, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium. They are all there. So when you look at the bottom of this one that says complete gardening, all-purpose grow, you see 24, 8, 16. Remember, we talked about those numbers and what they mean. Once again, it's telling you here the amount of each one of those nutrients that are already in there. So this is a complete fertilizer. Now, if it was an incomplete fertilizer, you may see 080. That means that only one of these nutrients are, are, are present. And that would be in this case, if we say 080, that means we only have potassium, we have no, um, excuse me, we only have phosphorus, we have no nitrogen, and no potassium present. So you need to know what your plants really need to survive and to thrive, okay? Now let's look at some really good um, fertilizers that are out there that are all natural. There are many good um, commercial fertilizers mixing mixes available, um, but you wanna always follow the application direction because you, you don't wanna go out there and just throw stuff in, throw stuff out there, and you don't know what it's doing or how much. So always look at the instructions on the back and we'll tell you um, how much you should be uh, using. Um, you can also make a nutrient by dissolving two cups of a complete fertilizer in one gallon of tap water. This mixture is highly concentrated and you need to dilute it. Now I have a picture of um, black cow. If you've been gardening for a while and you've been to one of your garden centers, you've probably seen black cow manure. Um, I don't endorse any products at all. These are just examples, but that is one of the more inexpensive ones and easy to find. And then on the right, you see earthworm casings. Um, that may be a little bit more expensive, but once again, what you put on your plants depends on your pocketbook. What can you afford? Are you on um, a restricted? Are you saving money and try not to spend a lot? Well, in that case, you may want to create some things from kitchen scraps as opposed to going and buying all these things because it can, you know, get expensive. I talked to someone and they were telling me that they had started, um, you know, growing and I got my garden started. And she says, I spent $300 on all the stuff. And I was like, my goodness, what in the world did you buy? Starting a garden, whether it's in a container or in ground, it shouldn't cost you a lot of money. Um, because the whole point here is that you're trying to grow food and you're trying not to go to the grocery store and spend a lot of money on that. So you should not be spending a lot of money to get started. That is why if you can start from seeds, a pack of seeds costs you, what, three bucks and you may get anywhere from 20 to 50 seeds, you know, in a pack. That's a lot more um, affordable. So think about that. You're going to pay three to five dollars in this day and age for one plant. So if you can start from seeds, it's gonna save you a lot and you're gonna end up with a lot more plants. And that's why I try to start from seeds because I like to share with people. I like to give it away and I like to see what people are gonna do with it. And I like to get people excited about gardening. And one of the best ways to get people excited about gardening is to share some plants with them. And once you give them that plant, it's kind of like, oh, 
I feel like I got to take care of it now, you know, so they're going to be responsible and they know if I gave you the plant, I'm going to ask you later on, how's your plant doing, you know, and if it dies, okay, not a big deal, you know, um, but if you're really serious about it, you know, think about starting, starting from seeds, you know, you may not want to start from seeds the first time, but think about at some point starting some seeds. We're starting, um, coming up on fall now. This is a great time to start gardening as well. It's going to be really cool. Um, so it's not going to be so hot out there. You don't have to worry with all the insects. So this is a great time to um, start some things from seeds. Look at something like um, starting lettuce. Lettuce is very easy to grow and it is a fall um, vegetable. Okay, so kitchen scraps to compost. I have done this um, and I did this with the kids at school. I wanted to show them how things really break down and how you can use your kitchen scraps to make compost. So what I did was I got this big pickle jar. My best friend loves pickles and she gives me all of these pickle jars. I don't know what to do with them all the time. But so what I did with this particular pickle jar was I started to put soil on the bottom and then I would put kitchen scraps there and then I'll put some more soil and then top it with kitchen scraps. So what you see here from day one to day 30, is actually what I got as well. And it's amazing to see these things start to break down, to see your kitchen scraps um, start to come and turn into something that you can use in your garden. And it's such lovely compost. And when you look at it, say, hey, I made that myself. And you're gonna be really proud of yourself. Um, when you think about kitchen scraps, think about what you put in your trash can. Normally what we put in the trash that stinks is the kitchen scraps. It's gonna be, all of these um, things, the potatoes that started to rot, um, the watermelon rinds, the, the apple that you forgot to eat, you know, all of those things is looking ugly now. These make your best compostable material. So you can compost just about everything in the kitchen, but you don't, you don't want to put meat in there. So we're talking about um, basically organic things, you know, um, vegetables, um, your coffee grinds, your eggshells, all of those um, can go into your compost and it makes the best compost. So it's basically you're getting compost for free. So nothing ever goes to waste that you're using. This is a better picture of, um, <clears throat> you see here, somebody peeled potatoes, they peeled carrots, they had some lettuce here, they had some eggshell here. So these are things that everybody would have, you know, in your kitchen on your daily cooking. Now, um, how you compost that is totally up to you. Some people have a little compost bucket that they keep under the uh, kitchen sink. Me, um, I'm a lazy composter. <laughs> I'll tell you what I do. I have a little area, my deck is off the ground, it's pretty tall. So I have an area to the side of the deck that I've designated as my compost pile. So all I do is just drop these. I'll put these things in a bowl because say on the weekends, I cook a lot more on the weekends than I do during the week. So I would take these things, put them in a bowl. Then at some point I would dump them into my compost pile. My son cuts the grass. So I have him to, to put the grass clippings um, from cutting the grass. And then in the fall, you're putting the leaves over there. So I'm layering with kitchen scraps, leaves, um, all those things that are coming from the yard that you that you normally would have someplace you try and find to put them, put them in the compost pile and watch all these things come, you know, compost down and give you really nice compost for your garden. So it's like a, um, it's almost like a closed system because nothing is going to waste. Everything is being recycled. So once again, I talked about the eggshells, um, the coffee grinds, and of course, everybody have leaves. So what do you do with your leaves? You know, I remember growing up, um, people would burn the leaves. Well, that's okay, but why not put these leaves into your compost pile? And before you know it, you're gonna have some really, really good compost to use in your garden. And these, this is really easy to do. And with the coffee grinds, what about your job? Do you you know, have coffee at your job? And do you throw that away all the time? Do you throw away those coffee grinds? What about the coffee filter? The coffee filter is made out of paper too. So it too can go in the compost pile. All right, one of my favorite um, things to put in the garden is fish emulsion. I don't know if you guys have heard of fish emulsion or fish fertilizer or fish amino acids, but um, this stuff can be a little bit expensive to buy, but guess what? You can make it yourself. Now I'm gonna be honest with you, it smells terrible. It's fish that's rotted. So it's gonna smell really bad, but it's gonna be really good for your garden and your plants are really gonna love it. It's um, really easy to make at home. 
Once again, you can buy it in different size container. You don't have to get one this big. You can get a smaller one if need be. But I'm going to show you what it looks like when you're making it. And I can tell you the first time I saw this stuff being made, um, I was taking a class. I went through a program called Habishaw, and it's an urban ag program. And we went to um, a farm, and Farmer Chris was making fish emulsion. And he, we all gathered around him, and he opened up the top of this container and it was the worst smell because this was the middle of summer it was probably july and he took that top off and it it smelled like what it looks like here but basically to make your own fish emulsion you need fish heads fish scraps i used to put a little bit of straw in there and some people put molasses in there and you just add the water and over time this stuff is going to break down and it's going to smell bad and look bad but trust me, your plants will love that. So you can buy it or you can make it, you know? The fish from the ocean does better than river fish. Now so let's look at sunlight requirements. Now I thought this was a given that everybody knew that you needed uh, sunlight um, to grow things, but some people didn't know that. So let's go over sunlight. Nearly all vegetable plants will grow better in full sun rather than shades. Now, however, leafy crops such as lettuce, cabbage, greens, spinach, parsley, they can tolerate some shade, but that's only because they're not producing a fruit or a flower. They're just greening up. Um, you don't want to make it a habit of trying to grow things in shade by no means, but if you have part sun and a little bit of shade, that's okay. You Optimally want to have eight hours of full sun for most plants. But when you're talking about green leafy vegetables, um, you can get by with about six hours of sunlight. But you always want to shoot for the most sun that you can get. Um, fruit bearing plants such as cucumbers, peppers, um, tomatoes, and eggplants, they need the most sun. So um, whenever we go out there in the sun and we're just burning up and hot and hurrying to get out, that is what the plants thrive on. They need that sunlight. They're, you know, photosynthesis happens in the leaves because of the sunlight. It all works together. It's a chemical thing going on here. And so one of the major advantages to gardening in containers is that you can place the vegetables in an area where they can receive the best possible sunlight. Once again, remember we said in most cases, your um, container gardening is mobile. You can move it. Now, this picture you see, these are not um, containers that you want to move. They're pretty much going to be stationary because once you fill them up with dirt, they're going to be very, very heavy and you're not going to move those. So um, I like to have smaller containers so I can move them around whenever. So watering, I talked earlier about what are you going to do with a container gardening when you're away? Well, when plants are in the ground, they kind of take care of themselves and you can be gone easily for a week and your plant is going to be just fine, even if it doesn't rain. But when you're talking about container gardening, and I'll use my boss as an example, <laughs> she started growing things and I'll give her plants, she'll take them home. And then she say, well, it died. And I go, did you water it? Yes, I watered it. Well, when did you water it? Um, I watered it the day before yesterday. The smaller the container, the more you're gonna have to water it, especially now when we're in the middle of summer. I water my plants every day. And I find that if I miss a day with some of the smaller containers, that it's gonna to start to wilt. Um, so be very careful and very diligent about watering. And I've just given you some examples here of what I use when I'm gonna be away. If you look at the top left, um, that is something you can buy these little um, spokes, I guess you call them, that you stick in the plant and you're basically just putting a water bottle on top. You fill that water bottle up, you put it in there upside down like that and it's gonna slowly water your plant. Now you can order those from Amazon or you could use just the way it is in the top right picture. And that's just a water bottle. And all we've done with that water bottle is to punch holes in the cap and make sure those holes are big enough so that the water is running out, but you don't want that water to run out too fast. You want it to be a pretty slow trickle. And you're gonna have to work with that and play with that a little while because um, what happened with me once, and as I said, you learn you know, by mistakes too. Um, I put the holes in the cap but the holes weren't big enough and so it didn't drain so when i came back 
the water bottle was still pretty much filled up. So you wanna test that to make sure if you look at the bottom right hand, you see that water bottle has about what, six holes in it and you see that it's draining pretty well. Now you could use that as fast as that's draining out just to water your plants that way. You don't want too many holes, but you want enough so that it is um, coming out, but not fast. And if you look at the picture to the bottom left, that is a very old method um, that people used in ancient time where they would take a clay pot and you would put the clay pot in the ground and then fill that clay pot up with water. And what the plant is, it's amazing how intelligent plants are. I mean, I'm just always amazed at how plants operate. Um, but you look at that bottom right-hand corner, those little holes in there, that plant is pretty much just wrapped around that bottle and is just drawing that water from those little tiny holes and is surviving that way. So you could definitely do that. And as you can see, you can refill that bottle whenever that water is gone. Okay, so proper watering is essential for a successful container garden and one watering per day is usually adequate. You shouldn't have to um, water more than one time a day if your plant is draining well, if you've got good soil in there. Um, however, poor drainage will slowly kill the plant. So if the mix become waterlogged, the plant will die from lack of oxygen. So with my boss, she's not giving them enough water. So her plants are dying really quick. She has a deck and the deck is totally in sunlight all day long. So you have to make sure you're watering those things all the time, at least every day. If you wait two days, it may be already too late because sometimes once the plant starts to dry up and the um, vascular system is, you know, drying up, you can't bring it back to life. There's a, so there's a, a fine line there between, okay, the plant is not doing well and the plant is dead or dying. And once you get to that point where it's dying, it's not gonna be a lot you can you know, do to fix that. So you just wanna make sure you stay on top of it. But not watering a plant is the number one reason why most container gardens um, don't thrive. So retaining water, this is important. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about these gels. And these are something that have become kind of popular lately. Um, these are water absorbing gels and you put them in your plant and as you water them, these gels, you can see the little, uh, on the left side, they're little bees, but then once you add water on the right side, they swell up. And what happens when your plant starts to dry out, they will start to release that water back into the plant. So they work very well. Once again, it's up to you whether or not this is something that you think you know you want to um, you know, work with. They absorb about 100 times their weight in water and slowly release the water into the soil as that soil starts to dry out. So it's kind of like a backup system for you if you do forget to water or if you're gonna be away um, you know, for a while. But to be effective, they should be incorporated in the soil mix before planting. So you wanna go ahead and get those mixed in. You don't wanna just lay them on top. You wanna actually put them into the soil before you start to plant. And if you don't wanna buy something like that, just use some mulch. You can use different kinds of mulch, um, compost, um, straw, pine needles, grass clippings, shredded bark, moss, moss. All of these are examples of mulches um, and they're very effective. I use um, Spanish moss to make it look pretty because it was free. I was in South Carolina and I just started pulling this moss and let it dry it out. And I used it on top of my um, plants. And if you go into a store and buy that, a small bag is going to cost you. And I'm like, why not just get me a big bag of this and you know, pull it out. A little story that was behind that as well. Um, I was in Hilton Head and I saw the moss hanging down. I was like, yeah, this is great. I'm going to go and grab some of this moss from this tree. It's low. And so I started pulling it and I looked down to my right and that was a little snake. So be careful when you get going off the beaten path. And this really wasn't far off the beaten path, but I got so excited about the moss. I didn't even think to look down at my feet to see what was under my feet. Okay. So this next slide, um, this is uh, what I call for a long time my secret garden because this is actually here at the extension office and um, it is outside the CEC's office, which is um, to the back and that's also the water department back there. But this is my little container garden that I had for many years that my boss never knew about. <laughs> I never asked any permission from anybody to start this garden. I just did it. Um, I went across the street and there's a company across the street that sells 
um, wholesale plants to landscapers. And so I said, hey, whatever pots you have that are large, you know, would you mind giving me some? So I started this garden um, on the back deck here at work and I grow all of my peppers here. I'm growing, I'm growing a very special pepper and I'll show it to you in a little bit. And so I just fill these containers up with all these peppers and I'm gonna pickle these peppers um, at the end of the season. But that is my little container garden there. And this is also part of my container garden here. Um, and those are the Bequeen hole or little beak peppers is what they call um, to the right um, in that. And then to the left, those are called matchbox peppers. They're both pretty hot. And that plant that you see that looks horrible, <laughs> that looks like a collard green plant, um, I left that there and I deliberately left that in the picture because people ask me all the time, well, why can't I grow collard greens or you know cabbage or kale in the summertime? Well, you can grow them, but as you can see, it's full of holes. Something is gonna start to eat and eat and eat it. It's gonna put holes in it. Then it's gonna completely strip down your plant. So if you can grow them in the summertime, great but collards and all of your leafy greens are really a fall and a um, spring um, season planting. And that is called Portuguese kale, by the way. And it was the first time I grew that and it is delicious. I can't wait to grow it again. And let me just tell you something about um, seeds. I found these seeds for this Portuguese kale and actually I didn't plant it right there. As you can see, it is growing between the concrete. So this is just one of the seeds that happened to fall between the concrete opening there and that thing grew and it was as beautiful and as healthy as you want it to be. I wish I had a picture of it um, before the insects ate it, but um, it grew so well. But these are some of the containers we got from the company across the street and they donated these containers. Now these are very big containers, so I don't have to um, water these as much as I would if I was growing in very small containers. And let me say one other thing, and I don't think this was in any of the slides, you want to um, use, you really want to dump this soil out from year to year if you can afford to do so. If not, you can add some compost on top of this, but if you can afford to change your soil out every year, it's gonna be much healthier for the plant. Um, I'll admit, I don't always do that. Sometimes I'll add some really good compost and I'll start giving it a lot of liquid nutrients. Um, when I water, I water with liquid nutrients and then I'll also water with just plain water. But I try and get those liquid nutrients in there as much as I can. So the plant, because what happens is your the water, when you water it all the time, the water goes out and it takes the nutrients out with it. So that is why you have to keep adding nutrients to it all the time throughout the growing season. Okay, this is another one of my um, container gardening areas. This is actually at my house on my deck. And this is my favorite place to be. Um, and this time here, um, I hadn't given away a lot of my plants. So you can see I still have a lot of stuff here um, that I was growing. And this was actually, I believe, later on getting near fall, looks like. Um, that wasn't from this year. And as you can see, I have all different kinds of containers. I have a storage container right there that I'm growing some stuff in. And that's just a regular storage container and I put holes in it. So it's big, so I can grow larger things than that. And that's the one down to the bottom right. Now let's talk a little bit about um, diseases in plants. Um, so vegetables that are grown in containers are just as susceptible to insect and diseases as any other vegetable. So by you being close up, you definitely wanna check periodically for disease and for insects that may be growing. Um, so if you don't know what it is that's going on, you can call your local extension agent, which is us, and we'll help to identify it. That's what we do here a lot of times. People bring in a disease plant or insect and we'll identify it. Um, and this one right here is a squash vine borer and I can't stand him. Um, and he made me really quit growing a lot of squash um, because the damage that he does is from the larvae inside. And if you look in that center picture and right there, you actually see the larvae inside. And once it's born, it just starts to suck the life out of the plant because it's really living on that plant. And that's how it's getting its nutrients from the plant. And so you see that kind of damage. And the only thing you can really do is to get him out. I mean, it's going to be an ugly job to do, but if you can get that larvae out, um, early enough, you can save the plant. So once you start to see that damage, that's what it's 
is for, is from. Okay, so some of the common problems um, gardening. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we're getting near the end here. Some of the com um, problems from growing in a container or in the ground, especially a tomato plant. Tomato plants, I love them. I love growing them, but they are very, very susceptible to a lot of problems. And you see the problems uh, can be a virus. It could be gray mold. Um, it could be tomato blight. It could be caterpillars in there. It could be blossom in rice. Blossom in rot, sun scorch. You could have mites on there, green fly, gr white fly, green fly, black fly, will, all kind of things um, can go wrong. So you want to also be able to understand what is going wrong with your plant and what you can do to fix it, if anything. And in most cases, there are some things that you can do to save your plant before you lose your plant. Um, and as I said, you know, call us, come by. You know, the best way for us to identify something is to take a picture of it, several good pictures of it, and that way we can kind of, you know, look at it. Don't bring us a dead stick and ask us what's going on. It's a dead stick. <laughs> okay. Um, another culprit uh, are squash bugs. We talked about the squash vine borer, and now we're talking about the squash bug. This is a very common one as well, and it can do a lot of damage to your plants. And then last but not least, harvesting. When do you know when your plants are ready to go? How do you know when it's time to harvest? I just took a tomato um, and just kind of give you an example of what it looks like and when it's ready. Now, this potato, potato, <laughs> this tomato went from green to red. Now, it's important to know what your tomato is supposed to look like when it's ready to harvest. So you need to know what you're growing. Some tomatoes are going to stay green. That's um called a um, German green. It's a tomato that stays green. You have tomatoes that stay yellow. You have tomatoes that are orange and then you have tomatoes that are red. So it's important to know what your plant should look like uh, when it's ready to harvest. So you want to be careful and you don't want to harvest before, even though a tomato can, you know, ripen um, on a windowsill, but you want to know what your fruit is doing and when it's time to harvest. And that means knowing what you planted. And sometimes it just take you doing a little research and looking up that plant. And so that's me. <laughs> and that's actually a picture I took today. And this is um, still considered a container garden. This is our um, raised bed box that we have out front here at the extension office. And so um, I grew a lot of these tomatoes. These are called sun gold tomatoes. And this is probably the only plant that is a hybrid that I grow. I usually only grow um, heirlooms and you know things that I can save the seeds but um, the sun gold tomato is one of my favorites and it is a hybrid so I just purchase a plant every year um, you know and and uh, grow those out but I have to remember that that is a hybrid so don't save the seeds from that because you don't know what you're going to get so if you're interested in learning a little bit more you can go to um, UGA extension publications and we have a lot of publications there that you can read, download, but we also have quite a few of them here in the office. Thank you so much, Terry. We hope that you will find our information informative and helpful. Thanks for watching, and please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel.